great. Uh, Mark gave a great presentation on um, the university approaches uh, for innovation. What I wanted to do was uh, uh, do the same uh, speaking from a utility perspective. Uh, as uh, Tom uh, mentioned that uh, I was uh, the innovations chief at DC Water for 16 years and uh, I wanted to uh, really uh, give a snapshot of uh, what I would call the ride of my life. So. Um, Right now, I'm actually uh, uh, the CEO of New Hub, a clean tech. But, uh, but before that, I was uh, the, uh, the innovation chief, and I was uh, responsible for uh, developing, implementing, adopting, uh, commercializing technologies uh, for, for, a, uh, for a large uh, facility uh, that's called the Blue Plains Advanced Wastewater Plant. And it serves Washington, DC, and, and the metro region. And we uh, implemented nearly a billion dollars worth of technologies in that 16 years. In fact, a little bit over a billion. Um, so uh, uh, one thing that I wanted to do was, um, before uh, touching upon uh, the, the, the whole innovation aspect, was to describe how Sudhir Murthy uh, thinks about innovation. And uh, so, uh, uh, when, when, when you start working at a utility, you have infrastructure, huge amounts of infrastructure that last for 100 years. Our, the facility at Blue Plains was built in 1938, and, uh, and that same investment uh, is, is still there. And so, uh, so uh, the, 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 the concrete infrastructure that we have at Blue Plains, or, or in a water utility, I call them the elephants. Uh, they are long-lasting technologies. They don't go obsolete. And, uh, and their gestation periods are hugely long, so it takes a long time for, for them to evolve. And, and so their innovation cycles are, are quite different. And, and then the machines, uh, the mechanical equipment, um, are, are what I call the horses. They have uh, shorter gestation periods and shorter lives. They are about 20 years, uh, the life of a horse, and, 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 and they grow to adulthood faster. And their obsolescence rates are about in that range. And then, of course, more lately, more recently, in what we are now calling the post-industrial revolution, we have the hairs, uh, the smart water technologies, uh, and, and, and they, they, uh, they go obsolete much faster, like your iPhone. You don't keep, them, keep it for more than five years, perhaps. But, uh, but, but, uh, but the gestation periods are faster, the obsolescence rates are faster. And, and in a utility, sometimes, uh, we confuse it. Uh, we sometimes think of a hare as an elephant, and an elephant uh, is, is also sometimes confused into how, how, how quickly we can implement it. And uh, our procurement methods are quite, uh, uh, quite not evolved to manage all of these three different uh, uh, animals uh, that we have in our uh, uh, utility. And, 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 and sometimes the uh, uh, incentives, you know, for example, the patent laws, uh, are created around horses. You know, 20 years is an uh, average patent life, and uh, they're not made for elephants, and they're not made for hares. And so how do we manage the incentives associated with all of these different uh, uh, things that are out there? And so, so you could have a smart sensor, you could have a, a mechanical equipment, and you have, um, and you have uh, these, these concrete structures. And, and, and from an innovations perspective, an innovations chief has to really think through how uh, you actually are a, um, you know, uh, someone who uh, uh, manages an elephant versus uh, putting in smart technologies in, in a water utility. Um, the other thing that uh, was important for uh, a, a utility uh, um, employee was you have, uh, you have infrastructure and sometimes you're building new infrastructure and, and often uh, you want to really put a lot of flow or you know, wastewater, or whether it's drinking water in that infrastructure, and you want to maximize that, and we call that intensification, where you do more in a less, less, less volume. But, but usually when you start compressing and uh, condensing things, like uh, Mark talked about MBRs, you need more energy. And so intensification usually needs more energy. And so uh, a, a lot of what we were developing um, uh, was, was how do we actually get convergences between doing things in uh, less space but also using less energy. And, and, and really the introduction of uh, the, the sensors and the smart systems really allowed us to actually bring in huge intensification, but, but also using uh, less, less energy, less chemicals, and so on. 
So, uh, so to, to really do intensification, you have to improve the physical factors that limit a process fa performance. People, it's really simple, right? Uh, in the end, it's the physics that limits uh, intensification. It's the physics that limits uh, getting out of this uh, auditorium uh, in, in case of an emergency. So if you can manage the physics, then you can address uh, and, uh, what limits process performance. And it could be, um, in this case, it's, it's hydrocyclones where you're managing gravity, gravitational forces. It could be uh, flocculation. It could be anything that really addresses the physical factor that limits process performance. And every single adoption uh, of that billion dollars that we invested was a physics-related uh, uh, implementation. And then the sensors and process controls usually uh, come in to help um, increase efficiencies and, and then uh, drive those convergences. And then uh, if you can address, in wastewater treatment, we use biology. Uh, we use bacteria to do the treatment, usually. And, uh, and so if we can manage the physics to create biological selection, then, then you can actually get huge, uh, huge intensification because now I'm retaining a lot of my desired biology and I'm getting rid of my undesired biology. So, so it's, it's a combination of those three that were what I felt were the essence of, uh, of, of, of a lot of what we did at, uh, at DC Water. And so uh, all over the plant, uh, uh, we were able to uh, drive those convergences, whether it was uh, the use of uh, thermal hydrolysis um, uh, right here uh, for, and, and, and really the physics was viscosity. Uh, in, in here it was dewatering where these are the flocculation tanks, gravitational forces, compressibility, and so on. So it was really understanding the physics and then driving huge, and, and I, when I say huge, it's 100%, 200% increase in throughput rates and, uh, and, 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 and getting more, more out of your process. And, uh, and once you uh, get that intensification, then you can drive biology. Um, in, the, uh, in the top uh, part of this uh, ch uh, chart, you see uh, we use hydrocyclones to retain the heavier and uh, because, because uh, uh, biological phosphorus removal requires the retention of, of phosphorus in, in bacteria, these are uh, heavier and denser materials, denser bacteria, so we use hydrocyclones to retain these heavier material um, in, the, in, in, the, in, the, uh, uh, in the bottom of the hydrocyclone. Uh, and of course, you have to develop the equipment and, and, uh, and, and build the entire uh, process together. And then in the case of uh, uh, a concept called Anamox, uh, where, which is uh, used for nitrogen removal, uh, we retained the Anamox organisms. Uh, these are these red bacteria uh, that have the heme protein. Uh, in the, in, uh, retain them using screens while we let uh, the, and wasted the material that we didn't want. So again, uh, if you understand the physics, you can create a uh, huge intensification, and then also you can drive selection of morphology, but once you select morphology, then you can drive function. And uh, uh, one other thing about physics-based inventions is that when you have a physics-based invention, it's a horizontal invention, it's not a vertical invention. And, and you can go and, and drive those inventions across multiple verticals. So, so if, if I have a technology which uses a hydrocyclone um, manifold, then I can use it across multiple verticals, whether it's a sequencing batch reactor, an IFAS process, uh, an A2O, which is really a conventional uh, BNR process, and, and so on. And then you can drive it across different scales. You can do it at a very large scale or even in a compact, uh, um, compact facility in, in, um, in, in, in basically uh, 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 you know, prefab uh, uh, metal, uh, uh, metal uh, tanks. Uh, I concur uh, uh, with, with Mark. Uh, every, every innovation and every commercialization we did at uh, DC Water was in collaboration with academia, with manufacturing, uh, uh, and, 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 and really uh, it was doing it together rather than the linear, linear model that most people talk about. Uh, linear models do not work. Uh, at DC Water, uh, over, uh, over the 16 years, we had about 80 masters and PhD students working at DC Water 
uh, to manage uh, to do their masters and PhDs. Um, and, uh, and, 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 and these students actually saw right in front of them these, the, their, their creations being, being implemented at a very large scale. Uh, and, 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 and when you go back, uh, when you go beyond uh, uh, the invention, which is discovery, uh, as we partner uh, in, in, in the invention process, we also partner in the demonstration process and, and in the commercialization process. And, and we were agnostic. It, it was not, it, it needed to be in the United States. It was really, uh, we, were uh, we were driving uh, these approaches all over the world. Uh, I wanted to close with a couple of slides. Uh, uh, you know, the, the title of this, uh, talk, this talk was Diffusion, Improving Diffusion of Innovation. Um, and, and maybe this is a controversial uh, uh, thought. Diffusion is too slow a process. It's a molecular process. Uh, what we need to drive is dispersion of innovation. And what I mean by that, we need these external uh, drivers that motivate humans. Uh, today, uh, almost anything that drives world GDP is driven by human capital, and we need external motivators that, that create dispersion of innovation rather than diffusion of innovation. Um, uh, if you look at the uh, world GDP, this is uh, uh, an estimate made from 180 to, to, to today. Uh, uh, the, the really, the, the change occurred in the, in the 1700s, late 1600s, 1700s, and, 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 by, by, uh, and some of it was really associated with the patent law uh, that was uh, developed in the United Kingdom in 1624, which really drove the human potential. It drove the, uh, the creation of intangible assets. And, uh, and, and, it, and it really drove innovation uh, in, in, in two orders or three orders of magnitude faster than the first 1700 years. And, and that was dispersion of, of innovation. And now we are really, uh, and, and, and that industrial revolution is, is, I would call a misnomer of sorts because uh, we depersonalize things. It's really a scientist and engineer's uh, revolution. It's not an industrial revolution as from, uh, but, but really it was driven by scientists and engineers. In the post-industrial revolution, industrial, in the post-industrial revolution, the need for scientists and engineers is going to be even, even greater because intangible assets, this is the uh, latest economist, or at, at least uh, the last week, uh, where uh, the, the percentage of the S&P 500 market valuation of intangible assets is now 80%. And, and so, so in this post-industrial revolution, our ability to manage human, human capital is really going to be important. At a water utility, we usually go through a, a, an approach of finding a problem and solving a problem. And, and utilities all over the world are littered with one-off cases where we've developed a nice new approach and we have not done anything about it. You know, it's there and it's just there in that one utility. We need to actually disperse that, you know, create a, a, a dispersion of innovation and, and we have to go through a whole process of uh, discovery, generating that intangible asset, developing, uh, you know, the equipment and methods associated with it and then and driving it forward. Uh, one final graph uh, slide is um, the scientists of engineers are, of today and tomorrow are, are really living in a complex society. We have, uh, uh, you know, the same graph I showed of, uh, of industrial revolution uh, is, is, is this graph in space, uh, which was developed by McKinsey a few years ago, and around 81, uh, the, uh, uh, the center of gravity of world's economic GDP was somewhere between China, India, and, and, and Asia, and, and, and then Europe on, 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 on this side. And with the, with the spread of industrial revolution, uh, it moved right out here with the United States and uh, Canada also pulling it uh, uh, in, in this direction. It's now moving backwards, and, 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 and the pace, the most rapid shift, and it's really because of the post-industrial revolution that is moving uh, in, in, in a really rapid way. It's creating huge, uh, huge uh, disruption, uh, social disruptions. You know, there's a sense of tribalism there, uh, versus globalism, and so we really need to start looking at how we as scientists and engineers uh, drive that uh, post-industrial revolution. And with that... <laughs>